Thank you, Ruben. Hey, everybody. You heard the gong, uh, and we are officially going to start Social Media Club Austin. Uh, my name is David Neff, at Dave I Am on Twitter, uh, and I'm the new president of Austin Social Media Club. So, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I missed a meeting, and that happened, so that's always fun. Um, how many of you are new here and have never been to a meeting before? Awesome, great, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, just a couple of announcements tonight. Uh, a couple from me, a couple from Kat, who's our, our vice president this year. Uh, the main thing that I want to announce to you guys is we have a new home. Um, so uh, before I do that, can everyone give a round of applause to the Bizarre Host folks for hosting us? Uh, Sarah here? Sarah here? All right. So everybody go up and give Ian a, a pat on the back and shake his hand. He loves hugs as well, so make sure you give him a hug. Uh, and, and thanks again to Bizarre Voice. So our new home uh, is going to be at the historic Austin City Limits Studios uh, at KLRU on the UT campus. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen the TV show, you've been there for concerts, you've been there for tapings before. Uh, but let's give them a big round of applause for being our home for the next year. And the uh, person you can hug and, and high five for that is Shane Eater right over there, who's their uh, director of development. Uh, so we will be at the historic Austin City, City Limits Studios uh, for our meeting after March, our first meeting in April. And we actually had somebody show up there tonight that called me. Right, so we've already got we've already got loyal followers showing up there tonight. Uh, so we'll do a, we'll do a, we'll do some great parking instructions and, and let you guys know more about that space. But it's going to be amazing. Uh, it holds about 300 folks at capacity. As you guys know, we've been selling out 99% uh, of our meetings, so it would be great to open that up and have even more people show up at our meetings. Um, so once again, make sure you talk to Ian tonight, tell him thanks for all the work Bazaar Voice did on our behalf, uh, and then catch yes, Shane Sarah. and talk to him as Sarah's well. And Sarah's in the back too, so you can, can give her... Can pick Sarah too for Bazaar Voice for the last Yeah, week. you can give her hugs and high fives as well. Uh, and if you're, uh, if you're tweeting that out tonight too, our hashtag is SMCA. So be sure to use that on your tweets. And I will turn it over to Kat. Okay, thank you, Dave. So I'm Kat Mendelstein, at Kat Mendelstein on Twitter. That's easy. So a couple things. Um, tonight we're going to be giving away some custom Twitter jewelry. I have my Twitter necklace on. Um, to win the jewelry, the most creative tweet on why you want the jewelry, if you uh, send it to at Jen Hearts Art, and she, I don't know if she made the video yet, but she's coming. <laughs> she's coming. So at Jen's Heart Art uh, with the SMCA hashtag after it on why you want custom Twitter jewelry, and that'll be the winner. And we also have cards for Jen. Uh, as far as if you want to order that, if you're not the winner as well, too. I also want to thank Brown Bag Deliver. Uh, their cards are in the back. They are the great people who brought our refreshments here tonight, and they um, make really healthy lunches that you can have delivered. So special shout out to Brown Bag Deliver, and they're in the kitchen helping us out. In fact, the uh, team's right back there. So make sure you grab a card and order a lunch from them. <laughs> and then uh, Brown Bag Deliver, without an S, if you want to give them a shout out on Twitter as well. And then also Deb. Um, Deb is our new charity uh, member on our board, and we have a new charity that we're going to be sponsoring over the next six months, Glimmer of Hope, and I'm going to have Deb come up and say a few things about that real quick. Hi, my name is Deb Robison, and there you go. Okay, there we go, that's better. <laughs> um, Glimmer of Hope, actually, which is right across the street, um, gratuitously, is a charity that works with um, women and children in Africa, Ethiopia, helping get them out of poverty through education, building schools, um, water, clean water programs, and microfinance. So what we're going to do this year, and we're asking for volunteers, can you hear okay? I was saying this morning, I'm back. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, we're asking for folks to help volunteer with setting up a social media strategy for uh, our, their project, Art Glimmer. And um, we need, I'm looking for three people to help with the social media strategy, a little bit of search engine optimization, and focusing on what they can do over six months for the small project. So if you're interested in volunteering, working with us um, over the next few months, please um, stop by and see me afterwards and I'll get your contact information. Great, great, thanks Stephanie. Thanks so Okay, and then our final announcement, I'm gonna invite Andy Meadows up. Um, 
Um, we actually have a new startup starting here in Austin this week that they're launching, and it ties perfectly to the panel on um, social video <laughs> for mobile. So I'm going to have Andy Meadows from 34 Doors. He's starting the startup with Tim Jordan, who's a, a longtime member and a good friend of a lot of ours, to tell you a little bit about the startup and I'm going to pre announce it. Be sure to shoot it out. <coughs> Thanks, Kat. Uh, again, my name is Andy Meadows. Uh, many of you may know me, or two of you may know me, from a company in town called Live Up 360. Um, and we started some products a couple years ago, and uh, over the next few weeks, we're going to be rolling that out to a new company called 44 Doors. You can find us on Twitter at 44 Doors Numbers. Um, what we're excited about tonight, the reason that we're here, is that when we found out that tonight was all about social and mobile and video, that's a perfect fit for us. Uh, so we wanted to give a little sneak peek for y'all. Uh, fortunately, I'm a bit under the weather, so I'm not going to stick around and uh, get y'all sick. But uh, if anybody would like to tweet to us at 44 Doors, uh, we'd like to do a special demo for y'all next week. Is anybody here going to be at TEDx on Saturday? Cool. Very good. So uh, you'll find our technology is actually going to be on every badge at TEDx on, uh, on Saturday. So you get a chance to check it out there as well. And uh, we'll be talking about that a bit over the next couple weeks. And our formal debut is going to be at South by Southwest, where we'll have several customers using our technology in their own marketing campaign promotions. So video is such a fantastic way to really encourage conversion. It's all about getting people to move them from interest to action. And video is a great way to tell the story. And mobile is uh, only going to accelerate things. So we're excited to be able to be a part of this. Uh, look forward to getting your feedback and having your questions. So again, feel free to tweet us. Uh, I'm Andy Meadows on Twitter. Or uh, tweet us at 44 Doors. And feel free to ask any questions. Look forward to talking to you all soon. Thank you very much. So uh, I will introduce our panel, and uh, Ruben's going to do the individual introductions, but I will introduce you to Ruben. Uh, so Ruben and I uh, have been friends for a while now. Uh, Ruben and Core Media Entertainment actually did all of the streaming for us for about a year uh, and did just a bang up amazing job to allow the people who couldn't make our meetings actually watch the meetings at home or from a coffee shop or wherever they are on their computers. Uh, we have some great folks back there helping us stream today as well. Uh, but Ruben is a new media entrepreneur uh, who hosted his first radio show at age 14 and has won national awards for his college TV show. Um, Ruben formed Core Media Enterprises, uh, and its goal is to bring socially aware and underexposed issues to the forefront. Ruben has over 10 years of directing live television and producing large-scale media events in Austin and nationwide. Ruben also has his Master's in Technology Commercialization from the Combs School of Business, uh, Hook 'em Horns, uh, and at the University of Texas. So without further ado, Ruben, why don't you uh, introduce the rest of the people and tell us about the panel. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. All right, so thank you very much for coming out today. We want to make sure that when you walk away today, you walk away with practical information that you can use tomorrow in this space. First off, let me get this presentation up and running because it would be no good if you couldn't see what's going on. So let's go and introduce our, our panelists. Uh, Aaron Bramley, as you know, uh, works with Mr. Neff uh, here, uh, with Lights, Camera, and Health, and he also is uh, part of Ridgewood PR, uh, a local company here in Austin focused on social media strategies and, and PR work. Are you get that right? Okay, cool. Jen over here, she is a former CEO of On Networks. I don't know if you're familiar, I'm going to be documented with On Networks, but it was a new media company that was started up uh, focused on trying to create and kind of disrupt the distribution model for media. She is now heading up the new startup, U Studio, which recently got funded. And uh, really exciting thing, she's going to help content creators really push their content out there to everybody on the web. And of course, Troy, who uh, first started as a school teacher, but now uh, moved over to Dad as his first startup. And uh, he's moved on from there to Kirkus Reviews, which is a, I guess you could call it a startup again, right? It's been around forever. But uh, now, uh, since uh, Nielsen, was it Nielsen? Or, who, who shut it down? And Nielsen owned it and shut it down. Nielsen owned it and shut it down, but calendars.com and Herb Simon, Simon, Herb Simon picked it up and they said, you know what, we're going to give Kirkus Reviews, which is a, a website that's focused on giving um, book reviews a uh, uh, spotlight, especially in the mobile space. So if you have an iPad, check out Kirkus Reviews. Uh, and of course, my name is Ruben Cantu, and y'all heard a little bit about me already. So let's go really quick over overview. Um, 
Troy here is going to talk about why mobile video matters. I will then come back in to talk about its applicability, how to, the vendors that are out there um, available for you to use, uh, and shooting 101. We're not going to have film school, but I just want to leave you with a couple key tips. Then Jen and Aaron are going to tag team on the creation, distribution, discovery, and key technology considerations that you can consider. So without further ado, Troy. So a lot of my work at Dad Labs was in online video, and uh, we produced over 600 videos for fathers, the new fatherhood, and uh, over 12 million views. Kirkus Reviews, I'm a product manager on the product side now. Today I want to start with a video that speaks to the promise of mobile, and I'll just jump right in. in the car isn't that unusual anymore, except for the seat of the car, the green pastures, the high seas, or a leisurely lunch. Radio Shack keeps you in constant communication with their affordable, transportable, cellular telephone. Hello? Oh yes, he's right here. It's for you. Yes, I heard about the merger. 500 shares. The affordable, transportable, cellular telephone, only at Radio Shack. The promise of mobile. Uh, you'll notice in the beginning of this film, he's a realtor. And so he's doing commerce. Mobile commerce of sorts. Number two, he's, it's not freedom from the wall. It's freedom from his car. Because mobile at one point was a car phone, not a mobile phone. I'm equally fascinated by this video by what the boy has in his lap. I can pull it up here. Wi-Fi. How did you get that? He's got a <laughs> flat piece of technology that has a keyboard and a screen on it. Kind of like a, a tablet. Kind of like a tablet. Or a speaking spell. Or a speaking spell. <laughs> right. In fact, that is Bill Gates right there. If that was the promise of mobile, this is about the promise of mobile video. I think we often think about mobile video as something you watch. And that's my number one takeaway today of four. And that is you can invert that idea if you go back and look historically. It's not just about watching video. It's also about mobily, if that's an adjective, creating adverb, creating video. I lost my mouse. You're looking at a snapshot that could only have been taken by one company, Sony. We've created a miraculous little video camera, the Sony Handycam, a completely different way to take movies. Light and easy as a still camera, yet can give you two hours of incredible sight and sound. So why just take snapshots when you can take moving snapshots? Click on the Sony Handycam and turn any TV set into a photo album. That was about mobily, again, that, that, that creating video. We now have one box that does this, and it does so many more things. Like we, could, we could list all the different things that have you know, been combined and put into this one box. I think by showing those last two videos, uh, they're fun to watch, um, but even more importantly, they show us the passion that an advertising agency at one point would have tried to convey of how important it is for me to be mobile and to be able to do business in a mobile way and for me to be able to capture images that are mine. Let's fast forward to 20, I can't believe what that says, 2012. And it's a Gartner report that indicates the top 10 mobile applications, not a lot of apps, but mobile applications that things we'll be doing on our mobile devices. And you'll notice number 10 is mobile video. I'm a big believer, kind of as a strategist, in uh, while mobile video, video can be consumptive, that if you think of it in relationship to these other nine, 
And if you treat that as my number two takeaway as a an exercise for you to take the slide and to see how you can connect to the other nine, that you start to see some interesting things happening in that one box. This slide, so going away from nostalgia, going away from predictions, let's look at that. Um, well, this is still a prediction, but some, some more uh, 2011 numbers. Predicted, this is a um, report that indicates, that, or predicts in 2011 we'll have over 50% of devices will be non PC, tablets and smartphones, for smartphones. They still make up only 25% of the market. Um, PC related devices still make up 70% of the market, 75% of the market. But nonetheless, that number is growing. And intensifying the actual numbers for consumption of YouTube videos have tripled. 200 million video views per day on mobile. More smartphones sold on laptops. I'm going back to the slide because remember my exercise as I was thinking through um, today's topic of mobile video and what I would do in a social media campaign that utilized mobile videos, how, I, how can I connect mobile video to these other pieces? And literally two hours before I came to this meeting, I stopped at Park Creek Mall um, to get my glasses fixed so I could see you all. And I was sitting uh, while I waited to get my glasses fixed and I saw this. First of all, there's a Verizon booth with a very bored employee on the upper right. And maybe you can see this. This is a table topper. This is a piece of paper put on one of the mall tables. And it says, text the code to watch the video. So you know if videos made it to malls, it's mainstream. So that means if you text that code, that video would play on that You get to vote for that. I didn't I did not I did not text. <laughs> but you can try it right now if you chose. Mobile website with the video on it. Send you a text link with with the link to the mobile website. You click that. When you text in, you'll get a text reply that has a link. You'll click the link and it'll pop up with a mobile video playing. You'll notice that, uh, again, my challenge for, for myself, and I would convey to you guys, is to try to connect these 10. This is a Zappos um, combining mobile commerce and mobile video, which they use their own employees to convey information about their products. This is Alvin um, Klein. If you took a picture of that code, you could see a very racy video as a result. And they wondered if it was good that we people were driving by doing that while they were driving by. <laughs> it's fascinating from Comscore. Uh, mobile activities in the U.S. percent share of total mobile users. And I want to focus on the verbs in the left column. Played, access, 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 listen, listen, access, 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 access. But look at that number three captured video. And so again, my recurring theme here is that if you think of video as something people watch and just consume, people are using their mobile devices to make movies of their children in an inner tube that has magically somehow just been punctured and you screaming across the lake. <laughs> and those videos are important to people. And it could be a two-way conversation, which we all know is one of the hallmarks of social media. And finally, I leave you with one more strategic point before we get more into the tactical of the evening. And there are two special categories that I think get left off the table, probably not in this group. But um, when people think about video again, think about it as consumptive. But utilizing live video to actually communicate with your audience. If you really want to talk to customers, and if you really want to talk to people, have a live video, allow them to chat. You can even, depending on software you have, you can pipe them in and have them appear and show something in a lower third. And finally, don't be afraid of user-generated video content. It can be very important. So with that mile have you, we're going to have to move more to the tactical and give it over. Thanks, Charlie. Some of the stuff that we'll talk about over that. By the way, I want to give a shout out to uh, Brian, original Four Kings out there. He's in the back doing a great job streaming for us. Uh, if y'all need any streaming services or whatnot, make sure you visit with him in the back. And also uh, to our, our sponsor, Brown Bag Lunch. Um, so, practicality here. When can streaming really be useful? I'm not going to get into the carrier wars of who's the best carrier on cell phones, but we do know that it's ever expanding, speeds are increasing. There's no excuse now not to be 
uh, connected to whoever you need to connect with. Uh, it's instantaneous. Your audience and your customers can connect to you, vice versa. Again, the more content you create, depending on the campaign you're leading, the more awareness that will be surrounding that particular campaign. Uh, people really want to be able to engage with you and the product, so give them an opportunity. Uh, live streaming allows that to do to happen like instantaneously, and of course, as a global reach and it's cost effective. You know what's ironic about this? I actually took this bottom picture from my iPhone while I was watching Justin TV. We'll talk about that in a second. The irony about it, we were talking about social media and video. This, does anyone know who's in that picture on the bottom? That's one of the twins. The one of the twins that is suing Mark Facebook. <laughs> exactly. Oh, here's Morgan. That's the irony of it. So anyway, when should I actually stream live? Uh, local and national companies run campaigns all the time. Uh, it doesn't matter how big your company is, you have the opportunity to do this. Customers even sometimes do their own events on your behalf. Let them cover the event for you. Uh, exclusive events such as this, not everybody was able to come. For those who were, thank you. And for those watching on the internet, you know, this is a perfect example of the use of it. Sometimes time sensitive moments, uh, say you're running a campaign announcement, announcing a grand prize winner, it's a great opportunity to go ahead and stream live. So, uh, this also lets you have live feedback uh, from uh, your audience. So actually right now, how many people are twi Twittering and following the stream right now? Exactly. So this would not be able to happen if we weren't actually streaming live. People would be just Twittering uh, and, and tweeting around, uh, but they wouldn't know exactly what's happening. Now they can watch and then read what's happening at the same time. And actually, like, like Troy said, you can actually pack somebody in if you build the infrastructure ahead of time and we can have someone pop up on the screen. Simply when it's not possible for you to travel. And now there's actually new business models that are arising that you can actually create pay-per-view events. So uh, if I have a concert that I want to stream or a keynote speech and we want to um, allow people to watch it, we're able to set the infrastructure up and you know, Jen can talk about this a little bit more and we can actually create revenue from the streaming events that we, we have. When should we try to record an archive? Well, by actually by default, and as you know, this stream that you're watching right now will be available to watch for the people who weren't able to make it today or weren't able to watch live. It should always be an option. If you have, a, if you have the opportunity, just record it. it. Let the carriers do the heavy lifting for you. You're not having to save bandwidth speeds or pay for bandwidth speeds or save for space. So let them do it. Um, because you're able to archive and record, uh, you're able to get some feedback. And sometimes, I don't know if you've noticed, but Feedback initially from the, the event or uh, what's happening may change over time as people um, watch it at a later point in time. You can actually track the feedback, good and bad, negative, um, to figure out exactly what happened at that event and what, what people thought about it two weeks later or a month later. Uh, always use it as marketing collaterals. Uh, all, a lot of you here are marketing uh, executives, marketing people, and you always want the opportunity to have people talk on your behalf, and you can, you know, as long as you get releases from the people, um, use it at a later point in time so you can promote your company and your product. Uh, simply, when you don't need feedback, uh, you can record it. Also, finally, when you want a more polished look, you can actually practice over and over again. A lot of people are like, hey, let's go to the park and shoot this thing, but a lot of people don't think about how many times they can flub up and things like that. So a 15-minute uh, session that you were thinking initially were, were, can that you were thinking about going out and making actually may turn out to be two hours, depending on your uh, pre-production. But it'll at least give you that polish that you want. So let's get down and dirty. Up here, what you see is the different vendors. Now, of course, there's other vendors out there that I didn't, I didn't put on here. And some of y'all were like, well, you forgot this person or this company. But for all intents and purposes, we're just going to talk about these particular companies because I think they're more prominent in the space. We're breaking up to two sections. Peer-to-peer, -peer, meaning one-to-one uh, -one or one to a couple of people, and peer-to-all, meaning uh, me to everyone else. So Ustream on top, Justin TV, and Livestream are all vendors that allow you to, uh, for free, actually, if you want, create a stream and send it out to the whole world and have it archived at a later point in time. If you don't mind ads, that's how they make their money. Let them make their money. You can get your content out, of them, out there. Uh, I'm becoming, it's so surprising, but I'm becoming a fan every, every day of Justin TV. I don't work with Justin TV, but they are doing some back infrastructure and catching up. 
and they're more reasonable than the other two. But you can look at the different pricing structures. Ustream right now is what we're streaming on. I like Ustream. They have a good infrastructure, um, and they have a good setup payment system. You can test that out however you want. But the key important thing, the reason I'm showing you this, is all of these have iPhone apps or Android apps. So you literally, you can go to your marketplace or the app store right now, download these apps, and you can start streaming live from your phone. I'll speak to the bottom really quick. Skype and Quick. Uh, now, mind you, I'll just say this ahead of time. Quick just recently got acquired by Skype, which is owned by eBay. Um, but what Quick allowed you to do is be able to stream live, connect that to your social profiles, social media profiles, and let your audience see what's going on immediately. And if not, let them see what happened uh, at a later point in time. You can even send <coughs> these private videos to send it to individual users. Now, everyone's familiar with Skype here. I'm, I'm not going too far here, right? So <laughs> what's really cool about Skype, though, is they just recently allowed um, mobile, uh, mobile connectivity. So that means if I wanted to, maybe if I can set it up ahead of time, um, I could probably call uh, Troy, I mean, Brian over there had in the back has an iPhone 4, from my iPhone 3GS on a 3G network, and I can video chat with them. And this is something that wasn't available before, and I think this is a real beautiful thing. You shouldn't do it while you're driving, I'm not saying I have, <laughs> but <laughs> it's a very cool thing. Now you're always present. Um, so there you go, uh, live stream, Justin TV, and Ustream. So rounding out my section, shooting fundamentals. Like I said, I'm not gonna sit here and give you a whole <coughs> seminar on how to light. But I do want you to walk away at least once a year on learning uh, or refreshing the couple tips that we talked about. Last year, Aaron led the workshop on actually how to shoot. Um, that was on regular cameras, camcorders that are out there. Now that we're moving in the social space, these principles still apply, but um, you some, some people don't always attend to them. So let's just go over real quick. Lighting, sound, and framing and composition. So these are best practices. Try to achieve them whenever possible. So, Lighting, there's basically three kinds of setups for lighting. You can get as complex as you want, but for these purposes, I'll explain it in, these, in this fashion. How many, I, maybe I'm going on a limb on here. I, I assume a lot of y'all don't have light kits. All you have is really the sun. <laughs> so, you go out there, let it be your friend. The moon, oh well, I don't know what you do while shooting in the moon, Jeff. <laughs> um, but, uh, just know that you don't want to shoot in the direction of the sun. You want the sun to work in your favor. The only thing about it is always moving. It's hard to get your shot. But if you can get your shot immediately, or it doesn't take too long, definitely do that. Clouds are getting in the way. They might, have, they might or might not affect you, depending on what you're doing. Two-point lighting. And actually, so you can understand the examples. The very top is a film uh, that I shot. It's a behind-the-scenes photo. And I don't know if you can really tell with the fluorescent lights uh, glaring on the screen. but. If you can see the director of photography, I was a producer on this, the director of photography and the director are looking at the monitor, but I just took this real behind the scenes shot of the sun actually reflecting back on them. And so, as you can see, natural lighting can really work for you if you know how to position yourself correctly. Two point lighting, real simple. It can be done for natural light or actually done from a key light. We call a key light a main light and that gives the most power of, of brightness um, in, in relationship to what you're shooting. Um, you can get a bounce board or a second light to be able to ref to soften the hard shadows that that first light is giving. So whenever possible, see if you can bounce a little bit of light or stand by a wall. Maybe that wall will help bounce some light back onto your subject or whatever it may be. Be creative. Uh, Three-point lighting. Uh, actually, you can see the second photo is a photo of two-point lighting. The sun coming in from the window and then there's an artificial light on the other side that's bouncing off three people. Three-point lighting. Um, you can get as complicated as you want with this, but all that means is that you're allowing a backlight to separate your subject, your product, from the background. So if this is possible in mobile space, try to do it. It doesn't have to be too complicated. You don't have to go out and buy expensive lights. Um, you can go actually to the Home Depot and get these hardware lights and they'll do the trick. Uh, and finally, shadows aren't your enemy. A lot of people like to light and try to get rid of all the shadows. Actually, shadows <coughs> are the So. Don't be scared of shadows. Just make sure they don't look like you're in a horror film. <laughs> uh, finally, color temperature. Color temperature is very important. A lot of people, y'all may not notice, but these, sometimes fluorescent lights give off green light, and outdoor uh, light gives off a little bit more of a bluish tint. Uh, try to keep wherever you're shooting, 
the light uniform so that way you don't have different sources of lights and intermixing and make your product look a little bit off, off color and, and fool the camera. So if you're going to shoot outside, shoot outside, you're going to shoot indoors, shoot indoors. And actually you can see from uh, the last picture here is a, another pilot we're working on. But actually Matt in the back there lit this, this shot here of our subject and that was all done with natural light. So it looks like it's professionally lit, but it's really the sunlight and um, just bouncing off some light. So look what you can do with you know, your own phone. Framing and composition. First things first, I should probably put this at the top. But no one likes watching shaky videos. Aaron will probably talk to this about later on about different accessories that we can acquire for our little phones if we want. But whenever possible, try to keep the camera still because the last thing you want to do is make people dizzy. The headroom and rule of thirds actually go hand in hand. We talked about this last year, but when you actually look at your frame on your phone, try to split it up into a tic-tac-toe like we did right here. And the magic spot for the eye line of the subject or the product uh, to allow it to give enough headroom, uh, so it's not cutting off their head but not giving it too much too, uh, is probably right in that top line space right there. If I could like point to it, that first top line between those first two bullets in the shot, if you can try to aim in that section, then you'll be all right. Now, this first shot up here has too much headroom. As you can see the one on the bottom, another part that we did, <coughs> that was a little bit better adjusted. So it's just about adjusting a little bit. Um, look space, look space is the direction that the subject is looking in. If I were to cut off where they're looking at, psychologically, that would kind of really feel odd to the audience. So try to give that person a natural space of where, where they're looking towards. And finally, a lot of people are like, let's put flowers, let's put plants in the, in the shot. And they totally like distract, they have branches coming out of the subject. You're like, did they think about this? Um, so whatever you do, when you try to compose your shot, try to make sure that you see what's in the background. It's, hopefully it's not distracting to what you're trying to say um, and actually complements what you're trying to do. Finally, get good audio. There's nothing worse than me and I want to talk about this. There's nothing worse than going out on the field getting a good shot, and then you bring it back into post, and you're like, what, are you, what is he saying? You might as well shot, shot a Charlie Chaplin movie. There's no point in that. So uh, sometimes with mobile phones on iPhone, you can't really monitor it. We were trying to play with it earlier. But you can't really do it. So record a little bit, listen to it, see what it sounds like, try to adjust accordingly. Uh, there's, so monitor when possible. And there's basically two types of mics available for production. But on, the, on, your, on your phone, um, you probably have a unidirectional mic that's just set up to pick up your voice. Uh, it's challenging, but if you get close enough to the subject, you can do it. There's omnidirectional mics that you can go out and buy. There's unidirectional mics. It's all you really need to know. Omni picks up this whole area here. Unidirectional picks up my voice. And with that, I'm done. All right. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, mobile video and events. And um, something really interesting happened about a year, no, two, two years ago or so. Quick came out, we talked a little about Quick. It was a, a live streaming application that can be used from your phone, right? Um, Texas Congressman John Culberson, I don't know if any of you guys saw any of this, but was actually live streaming from the House floor. He was live streaming a lot of his events, he was live streaming a lot of the votes, he was live streaming speeches, right? This is a brand new form of transparency that's really been brought about simply by having the technology of mobile streaming available, right? Um, so now you could be sitting at work or at home or whatever and see what's actually going on on the floor of you know the state house of, or the, the country's house of representatives, rather. Um, unfortunately, you can see that his last post up here was about 11 months ago. Um, there were some other senators who were not real happy with the fact that he was being so transparent, right? Um, you know, a lot, that was actually a whole bunch of uproar that came about that, right? Because people were like, well, this is a great thing. We're actually being able to participate in our government. Um, some of you may have also seen that the White House has now been live streaming a lot of their individual meetings, right? And posting on their Facebook page and things like that. But, this is the kind of thing that mobile video is doing for us. It's opening up our world so that we're actually able to see behind the scenes in some of these places that normally you wouldn't have been able to. Um, unfortunately, like I said, John Culberson's not doing this anymore because he was, uh, how to put it lightly, pissing off his friends. 
um, because they were, a little, you know, they're prepared for the main television, right, the cameras. They're ready for this to happen. But when suddenly someone can instantly be in front of you with a camera that's going out live across the country or world, right, that's kind of a scary thing. So um, he stopped doing this a little bit. Uh, I think we're going to start seeing some more of this kind of stuff in the future. Other ways that um, mobile video works well at events, right? Um, this was uh, something that uh, the Ridgewood team did. We went over to Scout Jam, which is the Boy Scouts 100th anniversary, and they had this amazing event out of Texas Expo Center where uh, we got to see lots of amazing stuff, including this uh, 19th century cannon uh, get blasted off, right? Um, and so we got really excited about it. And uh, what we had our, our, our intern do was actually turn the camera on us so that you see us behind the scenes filming at this event, right? And so where you know, eventually wound up was, in, and unfortunately what we didn't do was upload it at the time, right? That would have been as mobile as it gets. We had to film it on a flip camera and uh, upload it later because there was not a whole lot of good cell phone reception out there, unfortunately. But um, as far as promotion for our own company and organization, right? What better way to tell people what we do than to actually show them what we do, right? Um, and this was a lot, of, a lot of fun to shoot, and um, you can see our illustrious president's the back of his head over there. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's more about sort of the transparency of what our organization is doing. Now, from the Boy Scouts perspective, for instance, think about what a great way it is in order to show people at home what's going on. So they can say, yeah, you didn't make it out to this great event, but look what's going on right now. I shot this video on my phone, uploading it to YouTube, pushing it out through my social media channels, and you're able to see exactly what's going on right now, and people feel very, very involved. I think that uh, transparency is sort of the subject that I'm hitting on multiple times right now, and that's simply because people like to be involved in the process. Another example of uh, events in mobile video is uh, from an event that I had uh, called Real to Reality. It was the submissions opening process for Lights, Camera, and Health, our, our nonprofit film festival. And we were having a party, and you know, the RSVPs were going pretty well, but they weren't where we'd like them to be necessarily. <coughs> so, um, what I did is I went over there to set up for the event, and before I unloaded all of my camera equipment and all that sort of stuff, got out, went in and just pointed the camera at myself, um, shot a short video of me talking about what's going on that night, right? This big empty space saying, tonight we're going to have this, this event, and it's going to be great, there's going to be um, free food and free beer, and we're going to show some films, and it's going to be really exciting, and, and sort of show what the place looks like then, and say, hey, you know what? Come on out and see what the place is going to look like when um, it's all set up and everything like that. So I actually talked to two people that night who looked at that video that I uploaded instantaneously to my YouTube account, my Facebook account, pushed to Twitter, pushed to the Facebook fan page, right? Got it out through all my channels. And I actually talked to two people that night who showed up simply because they had seen that video that, you know, that I posted earlier that day. So sort of thinking about how this works for your organization. Now you also see, um, had the Good Life team given us a sponsorship Event, right? It would have been excellent for them to see their logo in the background, right? That's another sort of sponsorship benefit. You're going to see your logo in event videos that are going to be pushed out. Uh, live streaming is also a great carrot for sponsors as well if you're looking to sponsor events because now your audience is worldwide. It's no longer just the people at the event. So next we're going to talk about getting found, uh, and this sort of gets us into the search engine optimization portion of this. Mobile video is great for getting found, right, because you're able to do all that sort of amazing stuff that you would with normal video, um, and you're able to do it instantaneously and tied to a location. So the number two search engine in the world right now is YouTube, right? Um, some of you who came to uh, my uh, live video presentation sort of talked about this a little bit, but People are searching for how-to videos. They're searching for all kinds of things on YouTube. And so what better way to get found than to properly optimize your video content? Um, this is just sort of a little picture that sort of illustrates how difficult it is to get found. Plus, I like the fact that there's a town called Cheddar. Um, but other than that, I think that you know, really sort of thinking about what it is that your the point of your video is um, and trying to optimize your content for that. Um, what you start to see as we move forward a little bit is that location is coming into the sort of back end of 
video search engine optimization. So now I can show people, and they didn't get as specific. So this video that we had up there of the, the cannon fire, um, I wasn't actually able to type in Travis County Expo Center, unfortunately, because that's not an option. Pretty soon that will be. So someone visiting the Travis County Expo Center now goes into their phone, wants to figure out what videos were taken nearby, can suddenly see my content there. Sort of think about that as you're thinking about what kinds of mobile video campaigns are out there, is that pretty soon, content is going to sort of be coming to us simply by being places, right? It's extremely powerful, especially as a marketer, right? If you're in a retail store and you wanna show someone a video about a great sale that's going on next door, right? Just simply because someone's looking at their phone at the time that they're at a certain establishment and ready to watch a video, they can now, they can now work on this, right? We've um, also heard a little bit from the 44 Doors folks at the, the beginning, and I actually was, uh, got a great tour of that that software, and I think that um, you should take Andy up on that opportunity. Um, what they're doing is creating the ability for you to simply tag physically something in your environment, right? And point your phone at it and have it take you instantly to a video, right? Think about some of the applications of that. Some of the greatest applications of this technology I've seen have been in the real estate world, right? So uh, think about Seattle for a second, right? And uh, in Seattle, it's raining all the time, it's sort of dark. People don't want to get out of their cars to go look at, you know, they don't want to get out of their cars to go look at a house. Or um, all the flyers inside the little flyer are <coughs> disgusting and melted together and the ink's all over the place, right, because it's been wet. So picture a QR code or a text message option, right? Right on that sign, it takes you to a video tour of the inside of the house, right? These kinds of mobile video applications are really sort of where we're going, and it's all about getting your content seen um, by as many people as possible in sort of a new and innovative way. And with that, I'm going to uh, stop with this portion and turn it over to Jen, who's going to come up and talk a little bit more about distribution. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think we probably hit this uh, message pretty hard, but the reality is consumers are in control of their media experience. And I think the numbers that Troy showed, and I think the conversations um, that Ruben and Aaron um, just had with you guys, the comments they made really exemplify the fact that nobody has loyalty to any single device or network because there's yet another one coming out you know, the following quarter. I keep looking at my iPad going, I want the new one. My husband's not going to go for that. Anyway, uh, as marketers, that's really hard. You guys have to figure out where your consumers are all the time. And, and you also have to deal with a lot of technical complexity. So if you want to do what you need to do, which is take a show that you've invested in or a number of videos that you've made, whether it's for your, from your mobile phone or not, um, in this particular case, push it to the services that people use and make sure it also renders on the devices they use to get to those lovely little people on the other side. Clip art is so wonderful, Google Images. Um, it's, it's hard, it's really hard. And, and it's something that uh, is addressable, but it causes the marketers of the world, and I think the, most of the people in here are marketers, to, to have to become experts in a lot of different technologies um, and, and no longer just experts in your consumer. So, so we talk a lot about the fact that um, syndication is important, being where your consumers are, but, but also that every destination is like a, its own little country different customs, different languages, different rules. And those customs and languages and rules and, and business practices range from how they handle promotional video. So Hulu, for example, will not take your nice little you know, marketing-oriented video. They're happy to take editorial, but you can't reach, use Hulu's service to reach Hulu's audience with um, you know, a video that looks like an app or a video that you've taken at an event. Um, just important to know. It doesn't mean you can't reach that consumer, you just can't use Hulu to reach that consumer. So again, you have to understand the customs and the practices of each of those, those outlets or those destinations. Um, monetization options. So some of you may be thinking, like, we could actually make some money off of this video. We could sell ads around it. You know, we could not just use this video as a cost center for marketing, but we could also start to earn the company a little bit of money. We could start, you know, back in the day when companies would start magazines and and make a little bit of ancillary revenue on subscriptions. Um, you know, that's something you have to understand. Which of those video sites, which of those devices support money-making opportunities? And then there are subscription opportunities. Apple today, I think, launched um, subscription app 
options for publishers. So that's yet another way to start thinking about how to monetize the videos that you're making. Um, discovery is so different on every single platform. So you may have your metadata perfectly tweaked so that your video is searchable or findable on YouTube, and it doesn't help at all with daily motion, right? Because they have a different algorithm. And, and that's a tough one. You know, when you're, it doesn't help at all with Facebook, for example. So you have to become a master of SEO in each of those, again, those destinations, those services that you're using and taking advantage of to reach your audience. Um, it, I, I could go through every single one of these, but I think I'll belabor the point. I think you guys get it. Analytics um, is probably the one that we haven't talked much about at all, but critical. So if you want that feedback loop, if you want to make sure you're actually getting the return on the investment you're making in video, whether it's a time investment or a money investment, you need to make sure that you're tracking the analytics so that you know how many people saw it. Um, what was, you know, the, Aaron's example, two people showed up, so that was his ROI. <clears throat> so, to put all that in perspective, a single video being pushed to all of these sites, this is all the technical junk that has to happen for that video to render properly, to make it searchable, to make it publishable. And it's not all stuff you have to worry about. It's the reason companies like Ustudio exist. It's the reason Quick exists. It's the reason you know, there are lots and lots of services now where you can upload your videos to one spot and push to multiple places. So this is, this is not a political announcement for, for my business. Um, there are lots of places to get help here. But it is an important, it's an important point when you're thinking about syndicating because it's not an option anymore. It used to be, we'll create a website. We'll put all of our video on our site. And, and that's... It's not, it just doesn't sync with consumer behavior today. So what we know is people are becoming more fragmented. They're in control more now than ever. That genie's out of the bottle. And causing them to have to go to one spot to watch the thing you've invested in, the video, just doesn't work. So, so just something to keep in mind. And I think as we go through the different technologies available, and obviously we'll be up here for some Q&A after if anybody wants to get into more depth about any of this. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Aaron, I think. Can you talk a little bit about this? Sure. Um, I mean, essentially, we solved this problem. So for, for publishers, for people who make content, our entire, what, what fascinated me most about On Networks, the company I started before you, Studio, was that we were investing in great shows, great programming, original programming. And I'd walk into the media, and I ran the content group for a long time. I, I'd walk into the media services department and I'd say, well, we need these videos on these 15 sites because we just signed these partnerships. And they'd go, well, when do you want it there? And say, like, tomorrow. Why is this hard? And <laughs> they look at me and go, Jen, it's just not that easy. We've got to transcode it to this spec, and this company has a different spec, and we've got to then reformat it to this bit rate to get it to Sony. And oh, by the way, these we need to host, and these have their own different player. And it's, it, frankly, it's a little bit easier today than it was four years ago, but it's still really hard, because every time we think we've got standards developed, uh, new devices come out and new walled gardens, and new formats. And what I realized um, about a year ago when we started thinking about uh, building you Studio, so we looked at a bunch of different uh, types of companies that we could build, you know, to help business, business companies to help people like on networks, media companies and marketers get their, their videos out. And, uh, and what was most compelling was frankly solving this problem of complexity, which we saw was only increasing, not decreasing. So our mission is really to, uh, to serve the people who are investing in video. You know, we work with AOL, so the big guys, Answers.com, all the way down to little guys who are um, Johnny Walker, marketers, single content creators. And, and that's, that's our mission, is to help them get that return on the investment. Thank you. Thank you. So a friend of mine, uh, as I was sitting here waiting to go on, asked me whether I was nervous, and the answer was no, but I guess my body didn't get the message, and I don't really know what's going on. Um, so the only reason I bring it up is to try to like, get that out there, that yes, I know, I'm sweating through my shirt, and I want you guys to know that I know, and know that it's okay. All right, cool. So, <laughs> all right, so, um, Cool, so uh, this is a nice little comic that I found out that we're gonna talk about the difference between all these sorts of technologies. Um, and this is a little comic that I found out that I'm gonna let you guys sort of read through this as we're, we're going around. But um, let me ask you this, who here has an iPhone? Yes. Oh, all right. How about a Droid-based phone? 
Blackberry users? Like all you to leave right now? No. <laughs> I'm just playing. So, do you guys? What do you guys think about these sort of uh, descriptions? Right? Do they sort of line up a little bit? Right. Oh, you guys can read it. Okay. So, uh, the top one on the left, starting over, it says typical iPhone user. Then how she sees herself. How she's seen by BlackBerry users. <laughs> How she's seen by Android users. What you probably can't see is that there's a nice little image of Steve Jobs in her hand, right? So she's in the, the cult of Mac. And then this one is uh, the typical Android user. Let me know how he sees himself. The yeah, Einstein one. How he's seen by iPhone users. And how he's seen by Blackberry users. And then the last one is the typical Blackberry user. Uh, how he sees himself. How he's seen by iPhone users. And how he's seen by Android. Um, so yeah, I mean, we can have lots of fun with this, right? Uh, because we have all the sort of the battles and things like that. But the, the point behind it is, you know, pretty unique in that, right, we sort of have that user-friendly, more kind of don't need the customization kind of thing. And then we get down here and we're talking with the, the Android folks who <laughs> they want to walk in and, and or get into their phone and play around with their guts, right? And turn off certain processes and things like that, right? Um, it's not to say that there's one that's better than the other. It's just very different, right? Um, do you guys feel like that's sort of accurate at all? No? Yeah? Somewhat? People are nodding, laughing. Yeah, it's good to laugh at yourself. Uh, <laughs> not that I would know anything about that. Um, so... All right, so this is a nice little chart, and I guess I apologize for it being a little bit too small, but um, it sort of talks about, shows the difference between all of this different technology, right? And what sort of the main differences are in terms of video. Um, so if you sort of look up at this top line, you can see whether or not something has a front-facing camera. Um, and are there any phones in here that I didn't, didn't get that people have? Let's cover all of them. Covers everybody in the room. The so smartphones. Awesome. Um, cool. So the ones that I want to sort of hit on are the ones that are a little bit um, supposedly this chart considers them the best, right? And so uh, you look at the Evo 4G, and it has the highest resolution front-facing camera out of any of these. Um, and by front-facing, I just mean the one that is looking. At you guys probably don't know that. Um, <laughs> And it also has an 8 megapixel autofocus cam, autofocus um, with 420p resolution at 25 frames per second, right? So that is supposedly the best one out there um, in terms of video quality. Now, we've talked a little bit about this, how it's not necessarily the technology, but whose hands it's in. Um, so I think that that's definitely the most important thing, right? You can take great photographs with a Polaroid, or you can take great photographs with a, you know, fancy, fancy Nikon, right? Uh, it's not necessarily about the quality, but it is about um, how you're using it. But this is just a nice chart, and um, I guess we'll probably make this presentation available afterwards so you guys can actually pour through it and take a look um, as well. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I will say that's really interesting about uh, the iPhone, for instance, that uh, only a few of these other phones have is the sort of uh, dock in order to get video out of it. Um, and I think that as we move forward, being able to take video from your phone and display it in any number of ways is going to really be where some of this magic stuff happens with mobile video. We'll talk about some technology that's really making that very interesting, but I think that being able to carry with you a video library of sorts and be able to show it anywhere, right, is going to be very, very powerful for, for people, for sure. Um, as we sort of move along, this is an interesting uh, sort of thing to think about is from the consumption standpoint, what technology is more powerful for filmmakers? Right? So um, the way that we sort of look about this is that, and, and you guys can, can read this, but the main problem that people are seeing for filmmakers with the droid operating system on phones is that there's hundreds of these devices with you know, dozens of versions of the operating system. There's no uniformity. Right, in order for creating video standards for people. It also has no iTunes store or equivalent, right? So I guess there is a video marketplace, but 
Uh, it has nowhere near the adoption of iTunes. Um, the podcast features aren't all that great, right? It's, it's very sort of in its infancy. And part of that is because Droid's a young operating system still. Also part of it is because Apple has already built the content distribution networks um, that a lot of these other companies haven't built yet. So I think that from the distribution and from the, the filmmaker standpoint, we're really looking at sort of Apple winning out on this because people are more and more likely to be downloading content um, to their smartphone if they have, have an iPhone. Right. Uh, let's see here. This is another just a little comparison chart um, that you can sort of take a look at. The, the main thing that I wanted to look at was HTML5 support. Who, is anyone unfamiliar with HTML5? Don't be shy. Okay, so a few folks in here. So um, HTML5 is simply the next iteration of uh, HTML, which is the main programming language behind web pages these days. Um, but what it enables people to do is actually embed videos straight into it. It is going to be the largest competitor flash. Um, one of the reasons why it's important for us to be thinking about right now is because of mobile video. Right? There are these phones that do not support Flash, but are supporting HTML5, so it's becoming a new online mobile video standard. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of information here about what's great on video. Um, can you all see that at all? I see people squinting in the back. Like I said, it'll be available later on, and, and they're, they're really good charts to take a look at. But this, oh, go ahead. I'll put a link on the new uh, stream, and also if we can put a link on the social media. Whatever you want, buddy. Whatever cool. you want. Okay. <laughs> you say that now, dude. Yeah. Can't believe it. Um, cool. This is uh, something that's actually more pertinent to people, right? How many of you have like, been walking down the street and you see like the most amazing thing in the world, right? You see like a guy with a Technicolor dream coat. He's got the tinfoil hat on. He's like flame shooting out. There's something like, really cool. And you try to get your phone out and phone with it. You, by the time you get there, oh, the flame's out and it's gone and the bus in the way, right? Um, so, this <laughs> um, is an interesting little chart that sort of shows how fast it is from phone being asleep in order to getting taking a picture, is what the, the actual chart was. So, video is going to be maybe a little bit slower because you got to switch over to the video function or something like that. But the HTC uh, HD7, the reason that's so fast is they have an individual little button on the side explicitly for taking photos. So, it can go from asleep to taking a photo the quickest. Um, iPhone was next. And you know the test was a little, you know, maybe you'd be able to make it a little bit faster if you know your phone very well, because um, this person had them all in front of them. It was, it was kind of fun to watch. But um, I think that this is just one sort of issue to be considering, right? Um, as you're sort of working through what phone you want to use for uh, shooting video. So, any questions on sort of the difference between? technology when it comes to shooting videos. Well, obviously some of these phones that have faster networks are also going to be great because if you're shooting video, you want to get up online, you don't want to waste a whole bunch of time, right? Some of the faster networks are going to be better. As we move into sort of the more 4G and 5G um, streaming networks, right? That's going to help you when you're out in the field shooting um, if you don't have a Wi-Fi connection. Yeah, I saw a question right there. Is there any software for editing on your phone yet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I forgot to cover that. But, oh, okay. Uh, there, there is iMovie on the iPhone, but we try to do... Sorry. There, there is a, a iMovie for your iPhone. You can actually download that. It's like a $5 app. We try to do research on the Android side, but really didn't come up with anything. And maybe I was just looking wrong. I haven't seen anyone edit video in their I, uh, Android phone. But if you do, anyone here Android users, let us know, because I'm interested. Awesome. So um, now we're going to talk about some of those very interesting little unique gadgets that are especially for mobile video that can help make things more interesting. And this is um, the kind of the part of, of this presentation that I really like because I'm a huge geek and love little toys. So the first one is a fisheye lens for your phone, right? So basically the way it works is you have this little lens and then you adhere um, that little magnetic ring to it and then you can stick the fisheye on anytime you want, and it creates this sort of you know, fisheye effect, right? But when you're sort of thinking about, okay, I don't want my video to look like it was shot on a phone. How do I do that? I mean, this is one really interesting way, right? Um, or if you need to, I mean, sometimes the cameras are fairly, you know, 
limited scope, right? Maybe you want to show something that's larger than the normal scope of your, your camera, so you might want this sort of little toy. I think this one sells for 50 bucks, which seems like a lot of money for a little piece of metal and glass, but um, you know, if 50 bucks gets you three additional viewers who all spend $25, right? Done and done. Um, so I think little sort of things that can sort of help stylize. Uh, there was also sort of, as the iPhone 4 came out, um, a big push for getting that sort of more stable video because it was the first one that was really HD, right? Um, and people wanted to make the quality of their video as, uh, as good as they possibly could. So there was a whole bunch of sort of do-it-yourself Steadicam tutorials out there. And I actually uh, found a friend, I think in a couple of weeks we're going to embark on that project of making some. Um, but this is an off-the-shelf product that you can buy where you can put your phone in that little area up there and it creates this sort of very smooth, fluid motion, right? It doesn't have that sort of um, choppiness to it that it might normally have um, if you're walking around. I don't know if you were going to talk about, tell them about the app that makes it look like it's moving like Oh yeah, and then um, I actually didn't put that in there, but there is another app for iPhone called 8mm where you can... Um, get this sort of stylized video. So if you want something that looks like it's from the 1920s, you can do that, or the 1940s or 50s. It has a whole bunch of generations and things like that. Um, you know, just for fun and games, really. But um, it's these sorts of little filters and items like that that are really going to start stepping up the quality of mobile video to where people aren't able to necessarily tell the difference between something that's shot on a professional camera and something that's shot on um, a, a mobile phone. Now, we also talked about uh, audio quality uh, a little bit, and I don't have any photos of mics or anything like that that can be used. Anything with an eighth inch in can be used, and I say that um, with implied italics around it because you have to sometimes hack your phone in order to do this. Um, I had a friend who was really interested in trying to figure out how to get an external mic um, in stereo into his iPhone 4, and so we spent a lot of time um, testing the limits of not breaking things um, in order to try to do this. And uh, basically what we got was the microphone in, but only mono. That was the best we could possibly do. Um, and so I think the next phone that's really going to be useful for filmmakers is the one that has the option in order to have um, this. And I actually had a great idea that I want to put out to everyone um, here. And if you can find someone who can do this, I'm looking for a Wi-Fi enabled microphone wireless microphone, right? So you can hook that up to on a Wi-Fi network, right, with your phone, record audio that way. Anyway, so if anybody um, knows some people who can work on that project, please put them in touch with me. Um, next, we have another fun toy. Uh, this is something that is coming out. It's a projector. This is a micro projector. It sits on the palm of your hand. It's about the size of a deck of cards. Um, it produces an image that is 640 by 480, which is the normal well, what used to be normal television resolution is no longer. Um, but it can produce that image about eight feet wide. It has to be kind of a dim room. But think about this, right? Something you can carry with you in your pocket. Pull out, plug into your phone, and show any video that you have on there, right? It could be something you took that day. It could be um, content you downloaded from a store, right? You're able to share video with friends, live and in person, on this large format, right? It's got audio out. You can go ahead and plug it. It has some speakers in it. I'll bet you they're uh, pretty terrible, but um, other than that, you know, you can plug in some speakers to your headphone jack, and you have mobile video projector right there. Uh, this runs uh, $299. What's the name of it? This is the swivel, um, and since it is uh, high technology these days, there are some vowels missing, and I think it's the last E. Oh <laughs> uh, no, actually, no, 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 no. It has all of it has all the vowels. It's amazing. Um, cinnamon, C I N E M I N. Oh, okay. Texas Instruments Products is over here. Okay. So that's sort of like the, the gadgets and gizmos portion. Um, I really wanted to. Uh, I was I was looking for the live stream on my phone because I really wanted to create a paradox by taking the live stream on my phone and pointing it at the camera and seeing what happens and seeing what the universe exploded. But I couldn't find it. Um, in time. So that's sort of the other little gadget and gizmo is being able to have event you know, footage with you anywhere, right? Someone else is shooting event footage and you can be anywhere in the world watching what's going on right here in this room. Um, so with that, I think we're going to turn it over to some question and answer, unless any of my illustrious colleagues here have anything else that they would like to add. Aaron's awesome.
Say, I gave a workshop earlier today for the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and we're talking exactly about this. But I would say, um, familiar with the flip cam of the Codex Z I8, it's really, uh, really, real simple, straightforward camera that you can use. It's HD. Uh, David Neff has the Kodak back there, and he's a big fan of them, and I am too. Um, it has, you can plug in audio to it, so you can get a microphone. And uh, as far as editing is concerned, of course, I'm gonna stay on the Mac side, but there are, are PC solutions, and with nominal, about 200 bucks, you can probably uh, invest into some editing software and get yourself going. And of course, uploading to the web is free, uh, as long as you have bandwidth, so. Uh, probably 500 bucks. Yeah, that's it, that's about right. I also wanted to talk just about editing software real quick. If you're not editing on your mobile device, um, you know, I think uh, Final Cut Express is a great product, it's $200, um, Adobe, <coughs> Mirror Express, wait, it's not called that anymore. What was it called? Adobe Element 9, or they changed the names all around, but um, Adobe has an Express product as well. They also have a web-based editing software that you can sign on, it's a subscription-based thing. So you sign up for that and you upload all your footage and then you go and edit it later on on this um, software service model kind of um, platform. But I think that about 500 bucks will do you for sure, um, especially if you're going with like the flip cam option. But really, you just need your phone and a cellular plan and you're, you're good to go. Spend your money on the mic, yeah. not on the cam. Um, because people will, I think that's nice on this, but and it, it sounds good, but they won't watch good video that sounds bad. So, so uh, on the wall, you can kind of see like a real quick slide on what's available and how much you look to spend. On that, so anyway. Ruben, the uh, place port as well that Kodak makes is actually waterproof, but it'll do 1080p as well. Cool. Learn right, something new every day. Thank you. Kodak, place port. Kodak Rev. Oh, we'll talk afterwards. You, you answered my question. Oh, about microphones. Uh, Omni and unidirectional. Yes. Can you explain a little bit more of the benefits of one of the other? Okay, so next up. Uh, unidirectional mics really good for vocal, direct sound. If you're doing a quick interview, you want to get a unidirectional mic. If you want to go out there and capture many different voices or an event, you want to get a pickup range of omnidirectional, which is probably close to like 270 degrees. This one, not so much. You see how step away, you can't hear me. So there's other ones that are designed for a different pickup pattern. So, David. I have a question for you guys. Uh, so the opposite of that question, so if people in this room are looking to hire someone to do video for them. They should hire you, but not. No. They have a question about <laughs> someone's looking to be hired. Uh, what is a day rate? Or what is, like, if, what's a minute per video? Like, what are some estimates? I'd love to hear Ooh. different people on the panel talk about that. I'm going to pass that one on, because that's a hard question for me. Yeah, because the thing about it is there's professionally done video, like, with Let's think about network quality, and then there's like, hey, this running gun and this new one camera and stuff like that. So I think it depends on the client. Yeah, the way I talk to my clients about video is that uh, it's sort of like buying a car, right? <laughs> is that you can buy the, you know, the Bugatti $100,000 sports car or whatever, or you can also get, you know, an old you beige Volvo clunker from 1988 that well, is held together with update. Um, <laughs> but I think that. Um, it really does depend on what your, your budget is, and, and a good video company will work with you on what your budget is in order to figure out how to best spend that money. Right? The idea is that you turn that around into something that's going to help make more money, which you can use to make more video, which you can use to make better video, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. But I'd say in general, you did, and you can just imagine, it's people, it's time. You're paying for their time. So the more you can stack up productions, so if you have five different videos you want to do, the more you can get that done shot, at least in one day, um, you'll save some money there. 
if you're asking somebody to, to shoot travel videos and they have to be in five different cities, the cost of that on location, five different cities, five different times, you're hiring a lighting person every time, you're hiring the camera fix every time, um, it's going to just you know, naturally cost you more. So think about it in terms of um, the people's time and, and how much time you're asking them to spend on the shoot. The edit will be probably the same in either, but you know, you can do things for $20 per finished minute, $50 per finished minute, all the way up to you know, $200 per finished minute for, for really professional. I mean, the, the programming that, uh, that we did at On Networks, a lot of the programming right now that we distribute um, is probably, and it's all professional and TV quality, typically short form episodes. We've done you know, three minute videos for Answers.com for $200 and you know, some of the, the higher end stuff is around $2,000 per video. So the problem is we don't think in per finish minute any longer, but the production world sometimes does. So think about what your budget is, and chances are you can get something really great made for not that much. Uh, I just had a slide up there. Let me put it back up there. Um, but it was, it was basically explaining what you can really do on your own, or what I would recommend for you to start doing on your own, and then when you should try to get extra help. I have this more of a comment than a question. And Kayla Filo with Edgeweb Video, I do video. This has been super fascinating. Um, but I also like to point out that it's, all, it's not just about what it costs, it's also about the context that you're creating it in. And if you all are working with a lot of clients, you kind of, oh, yeah, if you're working with in the market or with clients, you need to look at what their brand, what their collateral looks like. And a video ideally should reflect that, at, depending on the context of, the pro of what you're putting out there. We had, a, we had a question here in the back. Kate. <coughs> Mine's actually a little bit more of a comment than a question as well, but Aaron, you just made a comment saying, um, as companies are successful as video, they'll make their money to produce better video and better video. Um, and I don't know if it's just a realization I made up in my head or I've read, um, but I feel like as marketing folks, I've always kind of been brought up that um, we want to produce really high quality video, like the best we can do. Um, but now that we have all these devices, our phones, our mobile devices, um, consumers are really becoming okay with seeing that really raw, hands-on, spur of the moment, you're at the event like you just did, you film yourself and put up on the web. Um, that's kind of what we're cool with now. And I was wondering if you think consumers are almost Turn, not turned off like professional, but they're more trusting of the, the raw, uh, on the moment video than they are of the really polished and produced cut. I'll, I'll take that if you want. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Kate. Uh, this is something I was talking about earlier, um, and I didn't actually get to show the slide. Really quick, what you see up here is my buddy Brian. He's on his iPhone 4 on 3G, and you are seeing this live. You can see me, everybody out there. Isn't that cool? So, um, to answer Kate's question, it all depends on what your brand stands for and what your audience has become accustomed to. I would say, this good too. Really cool. Behind the podium. Are going this way? Oh, look at that! Isn't that cool? I hope, I hope tomorrow y'all go and, and get this opportunity to do this, because this is so cool. <laughs> Any case, um, this is going to become distracting. So I just wanted to show you a proof of concept that does work. But go, coming back to Kate's question, yes, um, depends on how you've uh, accustomed your audience to come and expect their content. So for example, um, here's a quick, uh, here's a quick uh, spot we get for uh, Sweet Leaf Tea, right? And I don't know how many of y'all, how many of y'all actually been able to see this spot? User generated, lower end quality, but it hits the mark. And the audience really appreciated that. You can do this.
Now, now, how many of y'all want to go drink sweet leaf tea now? <laughs> I want to give thanks to uh, Matt. He was also on that shoot that back in the day. Thank you very much. Making that happen. What I found out is that it was such a great response that now playing Christopher plays this right before his keynotes every time he speaks. So that's really cool. This is what you can do with your own brand. Is that, is that user edited or user shot? Um, no, well, we, we shot and edited, but we, we wanted to give it that user right, look feel. Because I was going to say that one of the things that when I hire a, a videographer, I uh, work with a lot of I work with a lot of videographers and editors, and I think it's, um, in my opinion, and don't get me wrong, that the, the videography uh, uh, space is a little more crowded than the editor space, and it's really um, hard to find um, a really good editor who knows the timing. Like watching that video, the edit on that. So your, your question is, are we okay with raw video? In my opinion, we're okay with raw video that's live. A raw video that pretends to be edited, you know, this, this was, you were creating an effect here. And if you try to replicate that, unless you have an experienced editor, she or he, um, may not be able to pull that off. But uh, you know, a lot of times, my time is spent in the editing studio telling the editor, um, you need to shave off a half a second here, or, and getting real picky because you're trying to create this feel. If you, if you don't do it, you, you fail. So you have to be careful with this, but not necessarily live, in my opinion, speak to your phone. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, basically argue um, with Ruben a little bit in that I think that um, I think that in order to answer your question, Kate, I think that companies need both. Yes. Um, they, you know, we're, we're okay seeing the sort of poor quality user generated video, but at the same time, quality of video on YouTube is going up. It's really going up very quickly. And now they're gonna start allowing people to purchase things and see mainstream media on YouTube. So people are starting to expect higher and higher quality video. I mean, the, the expectation was set low, but they're starting to see that, okay, well, there's other options out there that are just a button click away that are really high quality that I can watch. Um, that said, I think that a company will, needs to have their About Us or their brand video that is really nice and polished and very slick and, and really impresses people, right? And then everything else other than that one video can be user-generated stuff that is, you know, slippery and easy and all that sort of stuff, but it, it really comes down to making sure that you are able to impress when you need to. Yeah, and I was just going to say, don't con confuse authenticity with um, poor quality. Because I think that's a great example of, a, of an authentic piece, but obviously very high quality. So when I think about the word quality, I don't, I, I don't think of it in terms of um, uh, whether it, it feels authentic. I think the point you were making about authenticity is exactly right. You know, it, the more authentic a piece is, the, the more consumers tend to relate to it. And I think that's, I don't know, maybe that's the rise of um, reality TV and all this. But uh, since now reality TV is active, but they want to make, sh make sure it looks authentic in reality. Um, I, I think, you know, we, we might tolerate user-generated stuff, but we do enjoy nicely polished and produced pieces. When you're uh, placing a video on YouTube, you can make uh, select an option to make it more optimized for mobile. And then, you know, we're speaking about SEO for videos. How important is the role of that play, and do the other uh, services out there allow you to select for mobile optimization? Is there a benefit to mobile SEO your video? Does Google or does uh, YouTube take a selection and say, oh, this person's on a mobile device, I'm going to show them the mobile videos first before I show them the regular video selections? Uh, I think Aaron, I, and, and Jen can all speak to that, but I'll just really quick, uh, Vimeo does have that option, and I'm going to be YouTube and Vimeo, sorry. Uh, really quickly, Vimeo and YouTube have that option, um, and you can select what's available, and, and if you have a plus account on Vimeo, but I think Aaron and Jen have great questions, answers to that too. Um, I think that uh, part of that mobile optimization option is about compression quality, not necessarily about, um, it's about the, yeah, the playback quality, not necessarily about um, the playability, right? So um, I think that what it comes down to is, is that video will be compressed in order to fit on phones and download faster, quite frankly, rather than the full 40, uh, 480p version, right? It'll be the mobile version that's, that's a lot smaller. Um, and that's what I think. Now, that said, Things are changing all the time, and you may be very right about that, but um, is that your recollection as well? Yeah, 
I think I think that's right. And in general, um, there there are a couple of things you have to think about. So not just um, you know is it, what is the size of the file and is it compressed at a level um, such that it will download quickly, right? Because if you're viewing it this big, it doesn't have to be as large of a file as the file that's going to be viewed on a 50 inch plasma. Um, and, and that's just a matter that can be done dynamically, that can be done by having multiple file formats. Um, I think the, the thing that becomes difficult is when you talk about video SEO, you're SEOing for a service. You know, there's no such thing as SEO for just Android, right? Yet. <laughs> we'll have to figure out how to game those systems, but you have layers. You've got the hardware device layer, and then you've got the service layer on top of it. Um, and, and so when you talk about things like SEO, and of course, it's starting to mean less about um, search uh, specifically and more just about can, I, can my video be found. Um, and that's kind of what I was getting up for. You can have, you can um, put great metadata uh, in place around your video to make it super searchable on YouTube, but that may not help you at all within the data notion system. Um, or Hulu, for example. So it really just depends on what service someone is using, Facebook, Twitter, to find your video. Um, and, and you have to make sure it's optimized for each of those services. But um, one of the things that we're, uh, and we're still in private beta, by the way, I should have mentioned that before, if you were trying to go onto our site, sign up, by all means, um, you'll most likely get an invitation uh, based on the fact that you guys are targeted. Uh, but one of the things that we're, we're messing with is, is a universal mobile link. And, uh, and in fact, I think we demoed it for you guys the other day. And so what, we, what we've done is we've created a, a video link that, depending on which device is accessing that link, so it can be shared through Twitter and Facebook, it'll auto-sense the device and, and allow you to play the video right there. And, and it'll spit the file back. But it just, it doesn't live on a website. It's not a video that lives on a website. It lives in the cloud. All of our stuff is cloud-based. But, um, but we think that's a, an important function and feature to be able to deliver folks because you don't want to be, you know, trying to gain that SEO and, and have to manage and keep up with all of the different ways of, of, uh, of optimizing your video. You want to have a file that lives somewhere with a universal mobile link. Thank you. I guess I wanted to share with everybody some of proof of what they're saying. I've been live tweeting with a guy who does online television in Glastonbury, England, and he's watching us. Hi. And so say hi to him, say hi from across the pond. And um, if you ever doubt that live video presentation, etc., works, you're seeing it right now. This is a worldwide situation this minute because we talk about it and we're doing it live. So great. Thank you, Richard. I have a question for all of you. Is there like an ideal length of a video? Like, is, when does too long become too much. I'll, I'll go first. Uh, to me, it's less is more right now. My magic number and what I've seen, and maybe y'all gonna bite my head off, but I'm at two and a half minutes. Like, I, I just don't think it exists. I, I get this question every year. It's two minutes now, it's 30 seconds. It's, it doesn't, I'll tell you our most popular show. Our most popular show at On um, was a seven minute show and the editor was really anal, he always made it like, 6.59, and, uh, and in terms of the engagement, because we, we always, this is where analytics are critical, we're always watching to see how long somebody's engaging with the video, and his engagement numbers were just incredible, because he was a good storyteller. The arc was good, and it was an informational show, but he knew how to keep the pace and the tempo appropriate for, for any screen, frankly. And, and the other, only other thing I'll say is my son, 10 years old, he will watch, and my five-year-old, forget about it, they, they'll watch movies on the iTouch without even, I mean, the television's there, the computer's there, uh, no problem. Just sit there and engage for an hour and a half, two hours, no problem, on a mobile phone. So, I mean, that's, it, it's about engagement, it's about pacing and tempo and, and knowing how to keep the attention span. And so, it, you know, don't try to fill up time just to hit a certain length. Oh, I've got to do two minutes, or I've got to do three. If, if, if the, the way you get your point across is 45 seconds and you think that that's, that gives you a great message uh, time frame, that's what it should be. Let the content dictate the time, but you may have other opinions. I agree with everything you said, but I would say if you're going to err, yeah. err on short. Because 
yeah, <laughs> and, and in the mobile experience, people are trying to get it as quick, you know, they're, they're in the shopping lane or they're shopping at Best Buy or something like that. So, um, and, and if you've got a, the more videos you put out, the more views they get, the easier it is to get accurate analytics about them to figure out how your product's behaving. And if you have never looked at video analytics, they tell you when the majority of your audience drops off, that you can, you know, look at that kind of information and, and you can adjust your product accordingly. I agree with absolutely everything everyone said, except I just want to add one thing, which is it depends on the purpose of your video, uh, especially when we're talking about mobile. I think when you're talking about mobile, oftentimes shorter is better because of load times. Um, if you're not on a Wi-Fi connection and you're trying to watch a video, it can be extremely frustrating trying to download 10 minutes of content when all you really want is you know, the preview or the, the verse. So it might make sense to make the mobile version of um, you know, a video that says, okay, this is going to be the compressed two-minute version of my 10-minute video or something like that, right? I just wanted to add that if you have a longer video and it makes sense to chop it up into a series, mm -hmm. better. Oh, I thought that was just advice, which I think is phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> I thought the question was if you should, you should chop it up into smaller pieces. No, I'm saying if you have the option, if it, it makes sense to chop it up into smaller pieces, better. Right, or, mul or uh, multiple versions, right? If you're uploading to YouTube or Vimeo, you have unlimited space. You might as well just put as many versions as possible, and people are going to pick the one that best suits them. Okay, I think we're on time on question. Um, Jen Hart's art. I think she may be out there with Kathy. She wants to come pick the winner. Jen, are you out there still? Sure. Uh, looking for a full-time social media person. So, uh, so Jeffrey Macramento wins his very own personal Twitter pin, ring, or necklace. Yay, Jeffrey! <laughs> And you can see Jen Hart's art out in the lobby with Kathy Benavides. That's your prize. Whoops. We'll have to republish it. I'll publish it from the Social Media Club Austin uh, Twitter ID later tonight. I don't know if I heard. But, or do you remember, Jeffrey? Here. Do you remember what your tweet was? <laughs> yeah, it had something that the beauty of your jewelry represents the tears of your soul. You <laughs> yes, I'm frustrated by it. Very frustrated. <laughs> Great. Well, I want to thank Ruben and our entire panel. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. We won't be having a meeting in March because it'll fall on top of South by Southwest. Looking for some notes on some things going on with the National Club. Uh, we'll be looking for some volunteers to help on a few things with them during South by Southwest. And then as Dave mentioned, uh, third week in April, Tuesday the third week in April, we'll be in our new home at KLRU. And again, thank you very much to Bizarre Voice for hosting us. Everybody have a great night.